Many brave pilots don't escape a daring trench run into the uncanny valley. This crevasse of despair is lined with ever-growing piles of downed starships, coffins for the damned fools who believe that they could fool the human eye. The damned fools. If only they just flew above it. Can't you see that you can't see around corners? You're going too fast. You gotta slow down. You're too ambitious. Your heart's in the right place, but your brain is gonna put that heart into a fiery gravy blender. Okay, everybody. Long time no talk. I'm nearly finished with a few different video scripts, just about ready to record them for future videos. But, I just watched The Mandalorian Season 2 finale, and I, I gotta talk about it. Now, obviously, this will contain spoilers, so if you haven't seen it yet, and you're watching this, what are you doing? Go watch it and come back. Don't think I won't spoil this for you. I totally will. And trust me, this isn't the kind of thing you want spoiled. So please, I'm begging you, go see it for yourself. Don't let me be the one to ruin it for you. If you haven't watched Season 2 of The Mandalorian, specifically the season finale, Go watch it, and then come back. This video will be here when you get back, I promise. Now, I've got a bunch of stuff to talk about, but I gotta get this out of the way immediately. Spoilers in five, four, three, two, one. That was Luke Skywalker, bitches! Yeah, but uh, we'll get back to that later. Okay, I'll put a little timestamp here in case you just need to jump ahead and hear about the Luke stuff now. But please come back, this is actually a pretty fun video. I need to get my watch time up, okay? Come on. Give me a break, huh? Will you, will you give me a break? Something subtle I really appreciated about the season finale is how Mando's slow walking through the hallways of this ship really evoked the imagery of Luke's uncertain steps through the halls of Cloud City in that transcendent classic known as The Empire Strikes Back. And I didn't realize it at the time, but this totally foreshadowed his arrival later in the episode. I mean, yeah, there's only so many ways you can frame a shot of a character sneaking through a hallway with a pistol aimed, but I, I swear that at least one of the storyboards of these shots must have been just a still frame of Luke from Empire. Now clearly, The Empire Strikes Back is my favorite Star Wars movie and is in my top five favorite movies of all time. At some point in the future, I'm going to have to make a long-form video detailing everything that makes that movie perfect, in my opinion. But for now, I'll do my best to not dwell on it too much, but there will be some dwelling, so get comfy. Before I talk too much about the Season 2 finale, I want to give my general opinion on The Mandalorian show overall, and how Season 2 greatly changed my feelings toward it. If the show has any shortcoming, it is that sometimes the extras just don't seem to blend into the world as well as they should. And the scene where Mando rides the speeder sideways across the screen is so painfully not real it hurts to look at. Some of the dialogue is also a little too Earth-specific. I mean, sure, the OT carried over concepts like meters and colors like Red Six standing by. This is Gold Leader. But there's just something about characters wanting their dragon meat cooked Medium rare! that seems unnecessarily familiar. This is the kind of dialogue that I would throw away in a heartbeat before I'd risk destroying immersion for the viewer. There were some earlier episodes where Mando reluctantly agreed to help some small villages with their problems, and as interesting as that was, I couldn't shake off this weird story of the week vibe. At times, the show ended up feeling more like Hercules or Xena Warrior Princess than a satisfying series set in the Star Wars universe. If I had to define it exactly, I'd say that every episode that features this let's help the village kind of plot structure ends up reminding me even subconsciously of the Ewok village in Return of the Jedi. Now the Ewok village, though charming and actually pretty fun to watch, is maybe the worst part of the original trilogy, and is the essence of what would go on to become distilled into the fine concoction that is Jar Jar Binks in The Phantom Menace. Now, that's a lot of baggage to hang on the shoulders of some innocent townspeople who are just trying to overcome a pesky ATST or a Tatooinean bullworm. 
which was actually pretty cool, and I liked the sand people involved in their deaths, so eh, we'll give that one a pass. But I still couldn't help making the connection. And you could argue if there was no ATSD in that episode, would I have made the connection? Maybe not, but I did, so here we are. I just can't get over how cheap and formulaic episodes like that are. But the show overall was good. I mean, the season one finale was great, some memorable episodes in season one, but it didn't really turn around for me until season two when I saw chapter 10, The Passenger. There were instances in that episode where I legitimately felt that I was watching a Star Wars movie, but not just any Star Wars movie. It felt like Empire Strikes Back. Now, why do I say that? It's not stuff full of references, there are no scenes that are complete copies of other scenes, but still. If you had told me that Irvin Kirshner directed this episode from beyond the grave, I probably would have believed you. From the moment those X-Wings open, that episode dives deep into the depths of pure Empire vibes. A chase in the clouds, X-Wings in the snow, waking up inside an ice cave to find oneself trapped alongside unknown creatures. And, you know, Baby Yoda creates this permanent Mogwai Gremlins vibe that pairs so perfectly with all the other creepy stuff in that episode. I wish every episode could feel like this. The show felt like Empire Strikes Back all the way back in this episode, and that was before Boba Fett showed up in his armor. This show is getting the vibe right. But in Chapter 10, the Passenger episode, I became convinced that for the show to truly feel like Star Wars, it would need to become essentially Mando's taxi service. I'm not a taxi service. No, Mando. You are running a taxi service. A taxi you service. smuggling strangers to dangerous destinations is so Star Wars. Is there anything more Star Warsian than bartering passage across the galaxy? Mando's taxi service simply must happen. And nothing, nothing will prevent this show from becoming Mando's taxi service. Nothing! <laughs> Well, shit. Great. Well, now what's he gonna be flying around in? Oh, wait. Oh, wait! That's better! That's so much better! Wave him down, Mando! Maybe I'll give you a ride. Back from the dead, assholes! <laughs> Boba Fett is back! And although we never got a flashback of him crawling out of the Sarlacc pit, eh, I'll take it. It's implied. He seems alive, isn't he? I will forever appreciate fan service like this. Deciding to have Boba Fett find his armor off screen and then drop in from the sky wearing it is maybe, maybe the best choice this show has made. I said maybe, okay? Let me have my Boba Fett love. At first, I was a little put off that he was not wearing his full outfit. But once I realized that this is actually Samurai Boba Fett, I quickly accepted this as the upgrade that it is. And I was surprised by how much I enjoyed seeing his suit repainted in the follow-up episodes. Now, I've always loved Boba Fett, but in retrospect, as far as his on-screen greatness is concerned, I think it's fair to say that maybe his awesomeness wasn't so much earned as it was implied. And while the prequels did a lot for Jango Fett, Boba never really got his time to shine. That is, until now. I kept wanting to see Boba Fett walk into the armory of his ship, up to the wall full of replacement long-range missiles. Since he only has room to carry the one with him, it's always like, well shit man, you fired your missile, now you gotta go back into town and buy another one. Because his Slave 1 fire spray ship lands with the back down, it creates a situation where the pilot ends up pointing up into the sky like an astronaut waiting to launch into space. It is this unique ship style that has always made it stick out in my mind as one of the most memorable ships in all of Star Wars. There have been many different interpretations of his ship over the years, but it's always maintained the same basic shape. Previously, it was considered that with use of artificial gravity on the ship anyway, it was simply applied in a different direction, allowing anyone walking around on the ship to do so comfortably even though they were technically walking on the wall of the ship while Boba Fett sat upright in the cockpit, piloting the ship forward. But, as it is depicted in The Mandalorian, 
it is now clear that the inside of the Slave 1 has a rotating internal framework that allows the lower deck to always remain horizontal to the ground, you know, when there is ground. Which is displayed brilliantly in Chapter 15 after they pick up Mayfeld on the prison planet. The fire spray goes through its standard upright tilt, but the others sitting on the lower level remain seated comfortably during this transition. I just love seeing the background shift behind them in this scene, it's just actually, it's actually really cool. Don't you just want a room like that in your house? That's like some event horizon shit. But given the opportunity to see more of the Slave One's interior, I would be really interested to see how much of the ship's total space is taken up by this rotating internal framework. Looking at it like this, it seems like there's little room for sleeping quarters or even cargo storage. On my way. You ever try to get fat? No! You don't have to! It's effortless! You can fucking lay on your back! Watching your favorite show, just <laughs> shoveling shit down your throat. What are you doing? I'm getting fat. I'm looking pretty good. Eat everything that makes my sugar salt go like, yeah, woo, yeah. <laughs> Comes right in. Nice roll of fucking flab. <laughs> Bill Burr is one of my favorite comedians, and it was great to see him involved in this show like this. And I can't believe it actually happened, but I think he might have actually escaped into this role. For a brief while there, I didn't actually see him as Bill Burr. They call him Miggs Mayfeld, a self-described realist and a former Imperial sharpshooter turned mercenary. Well, I guess that's why he was so good with the sniper rifle, that makes sense. But it did take an additional episode to really flesh him out, revealing how tainted his view of the Empire had become, to the point that he couldn't resist the urge to blast his old boss in the chest. Although I'm not sure why he was so concerned that the guy might recognize him, only to step in a couple minutes later when Mando needed to be bailed out of an awkward conversation. I almost wonder if in that moment at the table, Mayfeld actually felt kind of foolish and maybe even a little embarrassed that he believed that such a heartless leader could have ever recognized him. I also appreciated Mayfeld's slight jabs at Mando's willingness to break his own moral code when the situation called for it. I don't know, seems to me like your rules start to change when you get desperate. So what's the rule? Is it that you can't take off your Mando helmet or you can't show your face? Because there is a difference. And I'd like to believe that it was Mayfeld's words echoing inside Mando's head that finally drove him to remove his helmet and complete the face scanning task. Although in retrospect, it was probably his desire to save Grogu that pushed him so far beyond the cold, careless, uncompromising bounty hunter that he once was. I'll be interested to see what else the show has in store for Bill Burr, or should I say, Miggs Mayfeld. As for the return of Luke Skywalker, that was pretty badass, wasn't it? Huh? <laughs> yeah, pretty cool. Kind of like that. Kind of worth it. Kind of worth the wait. Holy crap, that was good. I like that. It was nice to see all the little details, you know, like the hooded figure, the gloved robotic hand, the green lightsaber, all building up to the reveal that Luke Skywalker came to answer Grogu's call. You really get the impression that there was love behind this depiction of Luke, a genuine respect for the character as we knew him all those years ago. And all joking aside, I'm really grateful that Jon Favreau and Dave Filoni set out to bring that Luke back to us, however they could. To have him arrive alone like that, walking onto the scene and cleaning up the mess of dark troopers like they were nothing, and adopting the child without even offering up his name, it's just very satisfying. And you could say that there was no better way that season 2 could have possibly ended. Now for the elephant in the room. The digital face replacement on the actor that played this version of Luke Skywalker. Could have been a little better. Could have been better for sure. <laughs> Keep your eyes open for those fighters. They're in range. Target's coming up. Just hold them off for a few seconds. Almost there. They're right behind me. Almost there. It's away! 
Negative. Negative. Let's go in. Coffins! <laughs> Could have been a little better. I, I appreciate that they didn't recast him. Even though Sebastian Stan, you know, the, the Winter Soldier, looks so much like him. I mean, look at this picture of him. That's, that's not Luke's face. That's Sebastian's face and Luke's hair. Come on. I think giving him his own Luke Skywalker series would be a much better use of his time than that other thing he is doing. But considering that they didn't do that, they had to make it seem like this person was really young Luke Skywalker, you know, as we knew him. The same thing was true of Leia and Tarkin in Rogue One. It honestly insults the viewer every time a character is recast for any reason. We know what they looked like before. Even though you want to escape into the show, you can't. Because every time you see this character, you're reminded, this isn't them. And everyone around them that is pretending it's them, is pretending. And yes, I know they're all pretending. But even if you tell yourself you don't notice it, your brain did. You subconsciously know that's not them. This is a different actor. The entire illusion is destroyed. This is why any attempt to digitally recreate existing characters should be commended 100%. If you're going to tell a story that involves pre-established characters, you need to do everything you can to bring back the image of them as we know it at the age we know them, or at the age they should be during the period your story is set in. All that being said, excluding Luke Skywalker's face, eh, I liked it. I loved it. It was kind of perfect. Now somebody make a deepfake of the whole face reveal scene so we can all bask in the perfection of this scene's true potential. Oh yes, that's so much better. <laughs> <laughs> they shot Luke's close-ups in such a way that they could easily be swapped out with better versions of Luke in the future, after we've successfully moved beyond the uncanny valley, and obviously this is the kind of thing that is a question of money, and the more time and money a project has, the better the face replacement is going to be. But I'm still not sure we've mastered this problem yet, even on projects with the highest budgets. I'm amazed at how effectively they can de-age actors, which is a similar kind of thing, but based on the results, it must be billions of times easier than a complete face replacement. But I'm sorry, I will never get over how even the average deepfake looks so much better than, than the CGI version of the face. Look at Carrie Fisher's eyes here. They're real because they are real. Why can't anyone in the effects industry integrate deep fakes into the process to, if nothing else, fix the dead eyes of their face replacements. With this tool, I shall give birth to art! Oh boy. What? One more thing. There, now it's art. Well, what do you think, Squidward? Just take it all in for a moment. Let it soak in. It seems like this depiction of Luke Skywalker was modeled after the reinterpretation of Darth Vader during the hallway scene in Rogue One. Everybody wants to see our favorite characters kicking ass in their prime. It simply never gets old. So even though Luke was quite gifted in Return of the Jedi, I wouldn't say we ever saw him reach the true peak of his power. And I feel that this episode really took a swing at that. It doesn't seem feasible for them to ever give Luke his own series and replace his face for the entire show. The only way he gets his own series is if they recast him, which I'm ashamed to say I would watch. But so long as they never remake the original trilogy, I don't see any harm in moving forward after it. At this point, it's basically just expanded universe. So do what you have to do to bring it to life. So long as the actor looks enough like the original, I can probably rationalize away the slight difference as they are just older now. Not sure I'd be able to get over the voice being different, but that is one reason why digitally recreating Luke's face and voice would be the ideal solution if it could ever be done well. If not, 
bring in Sebastian Stan or another lookalike actor that can actually act, and we've got a series. But who knows, it will probably never happen, and honestly, maybe that's a good thing. It was good to see Ahsoka introduced in live action, and I'll be curious to see her on her own series, where she will probably hunt down Grand Admiral Thrawn. Where is your master? Where is Grand Admiral Thrawn? We never did get to see what happens between Bo-Katan and Mando, as far as his possession of the Darksaber. She clearly wasn't happy about that, but I guess that means he is the King of Mandalore now? At least until she tries to fight him for the saber. Which was set up from the moment Bo-Katan proved to Mando that her word could not be trusted. You're changing the terms of the deal. This is the way. As far as the post credit scene, was I the only one that was freaking out when they both stepped onto the metal grate trap door above the rancor pit? Don't stand there! It's a trap! Don't stand there! Although I suppose the rancor pit is probably still empty since Luke killed a rancor five years ago. Unless they got a new one. Where do you even get a rancor? But more importantly... Boba Fett is getting his own show! You know, when this text popped up on the screen, I was like, it's, uh, it's just a book? <laughs> it's just a book? He only gets a book? After all that? Who do you think selling these non-existent tickets? It sure isn't Mando, it's Boba! It should have said streaming December 2021, and that would have cleared up the confusion. It's like, the book of Boba Fett, huh? It's a book. It's great to see Boba Fett taking over the old Jabba the Hutt throne, but his show better not begin like Riddick did where he gets immediately betrayed in the beginning after just claiming the throne at the end of the previous story. I just watched Boba get everything back and then some. Now let me watch him use his influence in the galaxy. Come on, I want to see him rule with an iron fist. If you told me that the Mandalorian show was ending right now and Boba Fett and Ahsoka shows were all that existed going forward, I would not have a problem with that at all. But there will be a season three, so oh well, I'll watch all three of them and see what these other shows have to offer. But even if Baby Yoda never returns, we still have to figure out the fate of Mandalore and whether Din Djarin will take a seat in a throne of his own. Now that he has essentially pulled the dark sword from the dark stone, I don't know. Not imagine even if Bo-Katan loses, I can't imagine Boba Fett won't want to eventually fight him for it. Sort of seems like that's what they're hinting at with him taking another throne. I'm not sure his appetites will stay so small. Well, that's basically all I have to say about The Mandalorian. The whole show is pretty decent, and the second season is obviously way better, but they're both pretty good. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the third season to see what happens next, and uh, yeah, that's about it. So, what did you think of season two of The Mandalorian? Did you like it more than the first? Probably did. Are you as stoked as I am to see The Boba Fett Show, The Book of Boba Fett? And were you happy with Luke Skywalker's appearance, or would you have preferred a recast with another actor that looks similar enough to a young Mark Hamill? Let me know in the comments below. Honor and fear were heaped upon his name. In time, he became a king by his own hand. This story shall also be told. Fed. Fed. <laughs>